Welcome back to the Psychedelic Podcast by Third Wave. Today I'm speaking with Christian Angermeyer, the conscious billionaire financier of the psychedelic renaissance. In times like these, people don't like new paradigms and are overly negative. I actually have an extremely optimistic view, meaning I think both MAPS and COMPASS with their respective substances, they will positively surprise for one very simple reason. I have never met a person who was touched by psychedelics who didn't become an advocate. I think pharma companies at the moment and big investors who are skeptical underestimate that bottom-up power and demand. Welcome to the Psychedelic Podcast by Third Wave. Audio mycelium connecting you to the luminaries and thought leaders of the psychedelic renaissance. We bring you illuminating conversations with scientists, therapists, entrepreneurs, coaches, doctors, and shamanic practitioners, exploring how we can best use psychedelic medicine to accelerate personal healing, peak performance, and collective transformation. Hey listeners, this is Paul Austin, founder and CEO at Third Wave today. We're sitting down for a very special conversation with Christian Angermeyer. We recorded this at the MAPS Psychedelic Science Conference in mid-June 2023. Christian is best known in the psychedelic space for being a co-founder of both Atai and Compass Pathways, and also one of the foremost financiers of this third wave of psychedelics. He himself has invested tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars through his funds into biotech, specifically in the psychedelic space through a tie and compass pathways. And Christian is an investor, pioneer, visionary in the cryptocurrency space, as well as the longevity space. So we had a fantastic conversation today. So there's a lot of overlap between my personal interest and Christian's personal interest. He just happens to have a ridiculous amount of money to support his initiatives. But going in and talking about Bitcoin, talking about longevity, the relationships between psychedelics and longevity, the relationship between psychedelics and cryptocurrency, talking about the centralization of psychedelics, which is the biotech healthcare model versus the decentralization of finance and Bitcoin. Christian and I went into all of these topics and more, and I'm going to read his official bio for you. Christian Angermeyer is a serial entrepreneur and investor who built and invests in companies that are shaping the next human agenda, a future in which technology empowers people to live longer, healthier, and happier lives. Christian's family office and private investment firm, Apuron Investment Group, has made more than $2.5 billion under management and employ 50 people across five international locations. Over the past 20 years, Christian has founded three unicorns himself and has been the lead investor in four unicorns and two decacorns, which I believe means $10 billion or more. He is the world's largest investor in psychedelics and is recognized for leading the current psychedelic renaissance, this third wave of psychedelics. There's a lot more there. And of course, we will get into all of this. Now, one other interesting aspect about Christian Angermeyer is that he happens to own ancient artifacts from Greece that relate to the Eleusinian mysteries. And in fact, this is what we start our conversation today talking about. So this is really a wide-ranging conversation, one of the most interesting ones that I've had on the podcast so far. And I really can't wait to hear what you think about this podcast, good and bad. As a quick reminder, head to Third Wave's website if you want to go deeper into this episode. We have show notes, we have a transcript and any links that we mention in this conversation. You can follow the link in the description or just head to thethirdwave.co forward slash podcast. That's thethirdwave.co forward slash podcast and click on the episode with Christian Angermeyer. All right, that's it for now. I hope you enjoy my conversation today with Christian Angermeyer. Hey, listeners, welcome to the Psychedelic Podcast. Sitting across from me is conscious billionaire financer Christian Angermeyer. Christian, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. 
It's an honor to have you on. You just got off stage with Rick Doblin um, speaking at the MAPS conference. I'm going to read a brief bio and then okay. I'd love to, love to jump in. So Christian invests in life sciences, fintech, AI, psychedelics, and cryptocurrencies through his family office, a Puron investment group. Uh, he made his first millions co-founding biotech firm Ribo Pharma with his college professors. His holdings include psychedelics biopharma firm Atai Life Sciences and blockchain holding company Cryptology. And I think most importantly, you own an extensive art collection that includes ancient artifacts highlighting the role that psychedelics have played in human history. Yes. Great intro. Hopefully I'm living up to it. Uh, I try. <laughs> Tell us about the artifacts. Why and what? Um, well, first of all, I think in generally, and let's come to religion specifically, I was always, I'm a history geek. I'm really loving it. But for many days, the one thing is I'm just interested in history and also in the history of religions. But also I think when you then look closer, we're still humans, we might have technology, whatever, but like sort of, sort of the basis, basic drivers, um, why we do things, good and bad, whatever stays the same. We're sort of, I love the book actually from Chuval Harari, the Sapiens and then Homo Deus, um, sort of, which explains so well, why are we, who we are, how our we bio, are. Especially our biology. Our biology is ancient. It's, biology it's and our brain, like, which is brain. both ancient. Like right. we, we practically, the, the, the way we are, it was actually formed like rather 20, 30, 40, 50,000 years back. And we sort of suddenly, um, I don't want to say we're apes, but like we have more than that. But like we're sort of these uh, kind of archaic being with archaic emotions, which we try to tame and which we try to develop philosophy to be better humans. But suddenly we also have nuclear bombs. And the question is, has philosophy and, um, and all the good stuff, was it quick enough yeah, in parallel with the technological development? Or are we like very dangerous um, sort of beings which suddenly have weapons at hand from AI to nuclear, uh, nuclear bombs. Existential yeah, risk. Exactly, which, which poses an existential yeah. risk, yeah. So, uh, but we can come to the, back to that uh, because your question was like, so, and so I'm, I'm always thought like by learning more and again, like huge fan of Harari, like, and by looking at where we come from, we can make better decisions for ourselves, like very individual ones, not always talking about investments, but also talking about sort of investments or companies, whatever. So I just think you can learn short version a lot from history. And then second, I I am, I always say spiritual, but like, I just want to say by that, that I'm sort of not believing in the organized part of religion because sort of what, but because I'm very spiritual, I'm, I also was very interested always in particularly the history of religion, which unfortunately has one big uh, commonality is that most religions actually start out really good in terms of meaning if you summarize christianity it's like love your neighbor like yeah treat other people like you want to be treated just don't be a dick yeah so it's, it's very golden simple rule, right? it's actually yeah. but then out of that golden rule became a religion an organized religion which at least for certain parts of its history was extremely violent and everything so you, you ask Dogmatic, yourself oppressive yeah right, how did we get things. there right. and i think sort of what always happens or very often to organized religions or to religions in the moment they want to become organized they need to actually get rid of the spiritual people yeah or, or let's say of the mystical people because like like in the early days you have a charismatic founder by the way who always says if you, if you read what jesus said like you that one of the core things what he's teaching is you can turn to god like a son turns to the father and talk to him, yeah? mm -hmm. which is kind of the difference what later came where the Catholic Church is like, oh, wait, wait a moment, you have to pay to go to heaven, you have to talk to us here, yeah, the Pope, the bishops, whatever. So, so practically, organized religions, unfortunately, always purge their movement from the real spiritual ones, the real mystical ones, because they, you cannot build an organization if everybody claims or maybe everybody really has the potential to talk to God because that's not how you build an organization anyway so it's just like very fascinating and then and then the other thing is um, I think everybody who has done psychedelics um, sort of realizes or at least thinks and then there is this guy who I adore Brian Murarescu who wrote a book about it and really researched it uh, and has partly proven it that sort of most likely 
psychedelics are the origin of all or most religions. Yeah. Um, which, by the way, is not my personal opinion, by the way, and we always need to make clear because uh, we already, in our pre-discussion, said we're going to jump from science to religion, whatever. Mm -hmm. This is a personal opinion, which is obviously not part of my science day job yeah, uh, because it's not provable. But I personally believe that psychedelics do open up uh, a path to God, the divine, however you want to call it. I'm always just cautious because when I say God, then different people have different... Source, mystery, oneness, yeah, the yeah, universe, but like nature. At the end, it's all the same. At and the I end, think, it's interconnectedness yeah. and yeah. interbeing, right? And, and there yeah. you know where religions come from. Yeah, so if you... And then you suddenly also see that our language is, is just so limited um, to describing certain psychedelic experiences or religious experiences and maybe both yeah so and then suddenly though you know you read the bible but you need any other um spiritual book and you're like oh my god i know what these guys were taking and really important this doesn't in my opinion sort of um, um weaken the experience these people and weaken the testimony it's actually in my point of view strengthening it because i truly believe that psychedelics are a path to god Gnosis. And that in those Eleusinian mysteries that this experience opened up for Plato, for Aristotle, for some of the most influential thinkers of Western philosophy and just our Western lens. And of course, when Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire, that yeah. was so cut off. The Eleusinian mysteries were like before Christianity, the longer lasting actually sort of, let's say, organized religious movement. So for more than 2000 years um, and very many... And one of the movements where we know for a fact that it was based on psychedelic consumption, which, by the way, which is another big topic we just had with Rick Doblin, hopefully supports also my, let's say, decision or opinion, yeah, which formed over the last years, that psychedelics are extremely valuable. Yeah, They should come back into our society as medicine, as mm -hmm. a proof medical drug, mm -hmm. but in a very regulated context. And I know some people are like, oh, why is he saying that? And shouldn't it be for everybody? But I'm like, look, let's leave the 60s out. Sure. Because the 60s, in we my point lessons. of view, exactly, they were an anomaly. Because right. like for 10,000 years, every single documented religion, which was using psychedelics, did it in a very regulated framework. The Eleusinian Mysteries did it twice a year. It was actually forbidden by death to talk about it, to, to spill the secrets, but also to do it outside of it. And it was very organized. You had to do prep work. You had to do, you had a shaman or priest doing it with you. You had integration work post, which by the way, is very similar to what we are creating. Yeah, with psychedelic assisted therapy, with preparation and then the, the trip and then, yeah, or the session and then the post work. So, so I really believe they knew how to do it and we should just look at those sort of, often thousands of year proven frameworks. Yeah, uh, The Lindy sort of, uh, effect is what yeah. Talib calls it. The longer something has been around, the longer it'll be around. So the yeah. longer that we, you know, have fasted and we've been omnivores and we, you know, live in relational communities with other people, all these things matter and, and, and make a big difference in terms of how long... Yeah, I mean, in general, you, you mentioned all the right things. Like, I think religions, by the way, and also not just in psychedelics, also in other... Uh, things in their core they have actually good ideas like again be nice to each other but for example fasting turns out is really really healthy all religions have fasting and whatever mm -hmm. it's just like a lot of religions partially or as a whole got corrupted by people seeking power over other people and using that as a tool yeah, yeah um, they become ossified in a way right overly dogmatic and yeah and rigid okay i have a burning question for you okay all right so I'll, I'll, I'll lay a, bit, a little bit of a framework and then, and, then, and then ask the question. So the way that I think about business, entrepreneurship, philosophy, sort of the evolution of life is that there are these attractor points in the future that are pulling us towards it, right? And one of those attractor points currently appears to be decentralization, mm -hmm. uh, we could say broadly speaking. So you're a huge fan, a huge supporter of cryptocurrencies, of Bitcoin, the decentralization of money. And yet when it comes to psychedelics, you're more of a fan of the centralized model, the FDA medicinal path. And I'm curious what you see as the core differences. Why do you choose to support or amplify decentralization in finance, but not necessarily with psychedelics? What are some of the key differences and reasons for that? It's a little bit though... Okay, it, 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 first of all, I think, what did you say in English? I don't say apple with oranges or like... Uh, or apple. No, 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 when you say you, you're comparing things which are not 
comparable fully. Like, is it called apples, apples to oranges? Apples to oranges. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I like um, that. Why? Why apples to oranges? So let's start. For example, let's start with the FDA because that's a separate topic. So yes, I decided that these substances should be medically used and medically used only. Yeah, and hence my company at Thai uh, plus Compass, where we have a stake in, are developing various psychedelics again as medical uh, therapeutics in an FDA and also EMA in Europe framework. So that is more, I would say, accepting, the path to approval is more accepting how our world is structured. So, and I know there are people that, oh no, this should be like, why don't we, whatever, change FDA? I was like, look, this is the discussion not for psychedelics. We can have happily have the discussion if FDA approval processes take too long, like if they're too cumbersome, whatever. There is definitely, by the way, for any organization, there's always a discussion to have, can they be improved? Yeah, or, yeah, and over time, unfortunately, any supranational and any sort of organization which exists outside of the democratic process of change, yeah, becomes normally too stiff, too rigid whatsoever, yeah? But I'm accepting that's the way drugs get approved, yeah? And I deeply believe that psychedelics should not be fringed, they should not be counterculture, mm -hmm. they should be in the center of our society and people should have access to it, by the way, paid by healthcare insurances and the only way to have that is to have them yeah, as an approved medication and should be sort of available, not just for you and me, we might be the ones who could go to the Caribbean or whatever, or to a shaman in the, in the rainforest, Costa Rica, yeah, Costa Rica the but for the woman and the man in Ohio, who might buy, maybe, by the way, don't want the dancing shaman around them, but they want to go, but they have a problem. As we all know, unfortunately, mental health issues are the number one problem of our time. Yeah, and they want to go to their trusted doctor yeah, and get it next door from the trusted source, trusted doctor. Yeah, by the way, who knows the history of the patient, which is very important because we're going to have multiple psychedelics and psychedelics are, I think, a very strong maybe the best group out there to, to help for mental health issues, but not the only one. Like maybe mm -hmm. the doctor says, for you, a psychedelic is not the right thing. Maybe we mm -hmm. have, or maybe it is the right thing. I just had this discussion with a therapist, but not at the beginning. Maybe we have to do some work before. So it is not so black and white. And I want people to get it, again, in the healthcare system, paid by insurers, by people who know what they're doing. Yeah, and the way to go, so this has nothing to do with decentralization because there is still like, decentralized in the way that there are thousands and thousands and thousands of therapists. I'm not saying, oh, I want to be the only sort of uh, therapy company or whatever. Yeah. But like the process in generally with all the sort of, again, critiques or like improvements we could make to the FDA is a proven process to, by the way, also scientifically prove what we all think is the case. But I want to point out like we're living in a luckily also scientifically driven world. And it's very important that we create the data we are creating so that we once and for all can say, look, that stuff works. Yeah, it's safe. Yeah, or maybe it has these minor risks. But like, I want to stand on like solid ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and I think the problem of the, again, by the way, that's what humans did over 10,000 years. Yeah, so I'm not sort of outside the norm, so to say. I'm actually... I see but it was as, much yeah. quieter, it was much yeah. more subculture, it was much more private, right? For 10,000 years, it's we have never lived no, it in, no, it in was a much globalized... More elite. It was much more elite. Much yeah. more elite. So I'm actually democratizing right. it. Oh, right. we are, yeah. So right. Because like in ancient Greece, like people always point to Elizabeth Mysteries, it was an elite cult. Yeah, You need to be invited and exactly. it was just for the rich and the famous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in that case, I'm actually decentralizing it right. because I don't want just the rich. Because that's, by the way, what it is. I'm a little bit poking back on the people because I know there are people out there who say, oh, yeah, Christian is a capitalist, which is true. Yeah, so I'm not ashamed of that. I'm actually very proud of that. But also saying, oh, Christian creates monopolies because he has patents. No shit, Sherlock. This is how yeah, drug development works. However, that is the most democratic way to open up medicine for everybody. Yeah, because first of all, I'm not harming any other movement, meaning at Burning Man, I won't go around from camp to camp and knock on the door and say, you know what, I have to... Patents on psilocybin, give me all your psilocybin. <laughs> yeah, it's joke, but like that's what people I think I, I do think that's what people are fearing. Like, you don't do like, that at Burning no, no, Man. You have better that. things yeah, to do. I have better things, things to do. Yeah, uh, and I'm also not taking it away from shamans. Yeah, who want to do it in their indigenous way, but I want to make people aware that whenever somebody tells me 
oh, but people can already go to the Amazon, whatever. It's like, who can that? Who pays the flight? Even here, like, I'm very, very happy that this conference is happening, but we should acknowledge that everybody who's here paid for a flight ticket and had the money to do so, which is great. Like, I'm happy, like, I want to just point out that, yeah, sometimes, especially people who see themselves more on the left, which are the ones who criticize me, are very elitist, yeah? And I'm like, look, I think everybody should have access. Mm -hmm. So practically, I'm not short version, taking anything away from anybody, mm -hmm. but I'm adding the biggest group of all, which is like all those people who live in, let's pick a state, Idaho. I'm from yeah, Michigan, Midwest, Michigan, my parents, yeah, you know, I who, think of that, yeah. Who want to go to, I can want to go to the doctor and want to get it paid. And that's zero competition. Correct. Yeah, that's just a different world. And then people who want to go to Costa Rica, people who want to go to Burning Man. There's more options on the table, right? Do it. Yeah, yeah, it has nothing to do in a, but, but, I think the fact that people can do it that out and proud and about, yeah, is based also on our science. So I think I do support actually indirectly these movements also, or the more, because like I give them the All credibility. Ships rise. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. All ships rise. And it's not mutually exclusive. It's not exactly. either or, it's both and. Yes. It's a it's a broad landscape. It's a blue ocean. It's a huge sky yeah. that's growing bigger every day. But right? to, to, to fully really answer that, I think we're really decentralizing it in a certain way and democratizing it and making sure context. that much more people in the healthcare framework have access to it. Yeah, there needs to be a structure built. There needs to be scaffolding built. And right, that scaffolding is both above ground and we already have a lot of the sort of mycelial network at the below ground that is communicating and educating. And I mean, to come back here seven years, six years later after their last conference at the MAPS, 11,000 people, it's you know, it's, it's fantastic, the progress that's been made. Okay, I have, I have one more question for you on this about microdosing. Yep. All right. So I started a nonprofit called the Microdosing Collective about a year and a half ago because a lot of the regulatory policies in Oregon, Colorado, you know, even looking through the FDA, it's not for microdoses that people consume at home. It's you go into a clinic, you go into a center, and you get a high dose. Yet, my hypothesis is that the vast majority of people who work with psychedelics currently are doing so at a more microdosing or psycholytic range. So, in other words, a lot of the research regulations, rules that are being put into place don't necessarily reflect reality, which is most people are still going to have to use psychedelics illegally because a lot of people choose to just microdose or start with microdosing at the very least. What's your thought on a legal microdosing regulated environment like we have, let's say with cannabis, where you could go into a dispensary or you can go into a situation and you could legally as an adult purchase microdosing supplements? What would be some of the pros of that, but also some of the risks, the cons, would you or would you not support something like that model? I think the biggest risk or the sort of most neutral answer is I don't know. And the reason why I don't know is because there is not a lot of research for microdosing. I think we all have a hunch, but interestingly, even like, uh, sorry, if I, if I not take the few just of my colleagues, but if I talk to some of the big um, uh, researchers in the mm -hmm. field, they, there is not a unified view on microdosing and in a, really in a neutral way. So the, the, the honest answer is, I don't know. So, so is it like, I give you an example, like I, I, I just asking questions. It's not that I believe one or the other. It's just like, like a scientist, like, yeah, we all know that the neuroplasticity, yeah, uh, which is created after a trip is very beneficial in the anti-healing concept, because mm -hmm. it's kind of, Michael Pollan said it in his book so beautifully, it's like you, people have sort of in their brain like ski slopes, which they are always using the same ones. And then neuroplasticity means like it has snowed and there is like an open, I would say, slate, a blank slate, and you can suddenly choose to- Fresh powder. Yeah, fresh powder. You can make new pathways. So mm -hmm. so just for the, as, a, as a picture for the ones who might not be so familiar with that term uh, neuroplasticity. So, and what we know is that, or what we assume is that that takes healing place in the, let's say, session, in the strong, deep trip. Um, people often work through trauma. People learn things about themselves. So there's many, we can talk about that more, like, but like there's psychological things happening, especially, this is why it's so important to have a therapist next to you. But then we also know that post uh integration is so essential because yes it is one thing it's already a very very important thing to learn certain things about yourself yeah to to make really important life decisions you might not have been able before to overcome trauma whatsoever but then in order to not fall back 
into sort of, let's call it old thinking patterns. Yeah, mm -hmm. You need to work on your integration and neuroplasticity seems to help you perfectly because it gives you this blank slate. So mm -hmm. by the way, interesting side note, these things are really well designed by whoever <laughs> designed it for us. Yeah, God. Because these, the, most likely, Nature. yeah, yeah. Uh, which is maybe the same. Yeah, um, but the, it's very important, like sort of, sort of the, the depth of a, the spiritual depth uh, of a trip plus this neuroplasticity I believe really work well together. But what is now, and I'm just, again, just a question why I was always very careful with microdosing, or what is, is like, what is if you're in not such a good place, mm -hmm. yeah, and you do now microdosing alone, so you create neuroplasticity, mm -hmm. but you're still in your old habits, you're mm -hmm. still in your old, without the therapy, without mm -hmm. the change, mm -hmm. yeah. And that really, again, it's very important, it's an open question, I don't know, but does it make it nevertheless better? So is neuroplasticity alone an improvement? Mm -hmm. Or does it maybe make it worse because you suddenly create deeper slopes, deeper mm -hmm. ranges for your negative thoughts when you're depressive? Like, I don't know. We need to find it out. So definitely, I would say that way, microdosing is very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Because obviously, if we can prove certain things, and then the other question is indeed the regulatory one, but like, first of all, we need to see is it valuable? We really don't know. We know everything we know, 99% of psychedelic science has been done for full, let's call it deep trips. Psychedelic yeah. assisted psychotherapy uh, exactly. so, is the technical uh, term. In the 60s as well. So this microdosing is a fairly new idea, yeah, worth researching it. Yeah. And once we know more about it, then we can talk about what's the right policy for it. Hey listeners, Paul Austin here. We'll be right back to this conversation with Christian after a brief word. After hundreds of conversations with our listeners, we found that the single biggest problem when most people begin to explore the world of psychedelics is sourcing the medicine. So we've developed a creative solution, Third Wave's Mushroom Grow Kit and Video Course. Just go to thethirdwave.co forward slash mushroom dash grow dash kit and use the code 3WPODCAST to get a $75 discount. I've experimented with a lot of different grow kits in the past, and this one is seriously next level. We've partnered with Super Nerd Mycologist to make this the simplest, easiest grow kit possible. It's small enough to fit in a drawer, and most people get their first harvest in four to six weeks. You get everything you need right out of the box, pre-sterilized, and ready to use, except for spores, which we can't sell for legal reasons. And speaking of legal issues, growing your own mushrooms for quote-unquote scientific purposes is 100% legal in 47 states. You can have your private supply of medicine without the risk. Our course also comes with a step-by-step high-quality video program showing you exactly what to do when you receive that mushroom grow kit. No blurry photos or vague language. You'll see exactly what to do each step of the way. Yields range from 28 to 108 grams, so this more than pays for itself in one harvest. Plus, you can get up to four harvests per kit. This is the simplest way to get a reliable supply of your own psilocybin mushrooms. Again, just go to thethirdwave.co forward slash mushroom dash grow dash kit and use the code 3WPODCAST to save $75. The number three, the letter W, podcast to save $75. What's the relationship, I'm going to keep going, between psychedelics and longevity? You're a huge proponent of longevity research and medicine. You know, you, I think you were quoted as saying, if you can just live another 15 or 20 years from now, then you could add several healthy decades to your yeah. life post or, 100. Or um, millennia, or no millennia, or hundreds of years. Like, I really am very optimistic. I, so, so first of all, yeah, that's my other big passion. In I'll add one more, one more thing, though. Yeah. And then what psychedelics teach us yeah. is, of course, death rebirth, this experience with God, right? They allow us to experience ego death, which we experience as real death. So there's a just an interesting relationship there about how could that experience help with living until we're 170, 180? You know, what is there? Is, is there a relationship, if any, between those yeah, two? Yeah, there, there is. I think there is. So first of all, it's my other favorite topic. So my two favorite topics are mental health in a broader sense. And obviously they're mostly psychedelics, but we also invest in mental health in other areas from neurodegenerative diseases to um, uh, brain-computer interfaces. And then the other is longevity, is really seeing aging as a disease. Um, actually, I'm very proud that one of my colleagues with whom I started a company called Rejuveron, he, Professor Manuel Serrano, he found out, or he actually found out is the wrong word, he, he has shown like in 2013 in a, in a paper which laid the ground literally for the entire sort of 
longevity industry mission, yeah, that aging is not one disease. It's actually, he called it nine hallmarks of aging. It's like nine sort of problems which come up the older we get. And then he enlarged it last year and added three. So it's now the 12 hallmarks of aging. Yeah. Um, and and the, the summary of those or sort of the visible outcome of these nine respectively 12 problems creates what we as humans then started calling aging. Yeah, and why, was, why this was so essential, because before Manuel did that work, people really believed, or some believed there is like a switch and something sort of, if we find that switch, like, yeah, we could stop aging at all. And he was like, it's not that easy. Like it's actually nine against 12 different diseases. But yes, suddenly even the skeptics were like, okay, but these 12 hallmarks of aging, they are very tangible. This is metabolic dysfunction, stem cell exhaustion, stuff like that. And the assumption is if we can successfully treat all of those issues, then we can slow down or even reverse what we call aging. And by that push, and it's extremely important, healthy life expectancy, and life expectancy in a very youthful state, by decades and somewhere maybe by hundreds of years, yeah. And what I deeply believe is that in the next 10 to 20 years, so not that far out, we're going to have this one magic year where we win in one calendar year more than one year of life expectancy statistically. And from then on, yeah, all bets are on because then you sort of win more than, than you lose per year. So having that and said that, some people say, oh, does Christian want to escape death and isn't death like sort of the restart, whatever. And I think those people who say that have not really thought about eternity. Yeah, because I do believe actually we are eternal souls and eternity is really long because it's eternal. So it doesn't matter if we live, matter in a good way, if we live 100 years or 500 years or even if we, someone live 5,000 years. Yeah, because at a certain point something will happen that you cease to exist, yeah? Because even the best medicine, if there is an accident, yeah? But go further, like even if we live long, 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 somewhere in this universe will end and then a new one will be created. There is always an end to something. No, it's like in a spirit of God, because like people- It's very people true, it's very cannot, true. I had this one trip, and this was the most beautiful one, where I really understood the concept of real eternity. It's really long. And in this eternity, you can have all- the opportunities and a year, hundred years, thousand years, that's all just a blink. Yeah. And sort of what I can tell is that I think this life, and especially by the way, this time, I think we're at one of the most interesting times of human history ever. Yeah. Are worth to be lived and are worth to be explored. Yeah. And I have a really big sort of curiosity. Where are we going? Yeah. Also, which was also part of the discussion we had, is if we give, and I hopefully it's not an if, but a when we give people the opportunity to live some hundreds of years, we need to acknowledge that not everybody wants that. Yeah, but I think it's really a big liberation that we say, hey, it's your life. Yeah, we hopefully, my companies in, in longevity, Rejuveron and Cambrian, but also others, hopefully, and in, at the end, it's the entire biotech industry together, we hopefully giving people soon the option to live very long. And with that, we need to rethink that we need to give people also the allowance to say, that's it, like I had enough. And by the way, I also think not even, we don't even need to wait till an accident somewhere or this universe ends. I deeply believe that someone, every human being will say, you know what, I had enough. Yeah, and they want to see what's next. And we need to allow people to say, you know, I had enough. And maybe some people had enough after 100 years. Maybe some people, like, at the moment I would say, oh, I'm going to go on and go on. But maybe in 500 years I'm like, look, now it's really always the same. Like, uh, let's see what's next. Someone it's going to come. But I want to give us the option to, to go on as long as we please because this life is fucking awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And this even comes back to, you know, some we were talking about religion to open and, and traditions and how we perceive death. And, you know, in the Bible, they would talk about how these, you know, Moses and Abraham would live to hundreds of years. And I don't think we need to debate whether that's true or not necessarily, but there's clearly in our mythos sort of as a human, especially as a Western civilization, the sense of what's it like to live a long time and, and become even a mythical like figure, which I think is also really key in this is like, a lot of us are awakening to godhood through plant medicines and then asking, 
not how do we become God, but how could we become as expressed as we want? By the way, it's this, it's this extremely uh, important point because what you say is it's true. Like most religions have these stories of their forefathers living very, very long. Yeah. Uh, which is interesting because what has happened, again, Christianity was not always the best one. Yeah. Because what has happened is like in most religions, God or the gods bestow immortality or a very long life to the best, the brightest, the most moral ones. It were always the good people. It was uh, Moses or Abraham. Like, yeah, it was like, it was the Greek heroes, the demigods, whatsoever. So immortality or a very long life was associated to be good and a gift. So it comes in Christianity, who someone, by the way, decided, unfortunately, which is also related that they really cleansed their own religion from psychedelics because they wanted to become an organization, that it's a good idea to rule people with fear yeah, uh, and eternal damnation unless you be a very subordinate uh, citizen. So, And in this context, suddenly living very long was, they, they, they painted as, oh, you want to escape judgment because we are judgment. Yeah. So, so it's, it's actually an interesting shift in medieval ages where suddenly the bad people live very long. Dracula lives very long. Demons live very long. Yeah, Monsters live very long. Yeah, But humans should soon find their judgment and just judgment, you will survive or we'll make it with the Catholic Church. So that is unfortunately, which is still deeply rooted. I'm always very fascinated how much people are like, oh no, we shouldn't live forever. And then I'm like, what? Like, like, yeah, it's like, I don't even understand it, but it is really, people are more influenced by these very old, very deep-rooted fears religion has put into us, yeah, uh, and we should overcome it and go back where we celebrated uh, a long life. So Compass, Pathways, and Atai, these are two companies that you've been quite influential in not only financing, but publicly supporting, amplifying through media, you know, really backing, you really believe in them. Um, for good reason. And it's been an interesting path these last, I would say, four or five years. I don't remember when. Compass... 2017. 2017, yeah. right. So the last six years even. I'm, I'm curious now that we're in 2023, we're on the cusp of MDMA being ideally medicalized next year, psilocybin soon to follow. In the last, especially three years, as we've hit an economic recession, stock prices have really dipped. What have been some of just the challenges that have come up in, 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 in you know, specifically Compass, but also a tie, bringing things through clinical trials and, you know, a lot of the, the bureaucracy and the lack of maybe financing that's come through. I'm just curious, kind of like, what, yeah, what, what's been the, 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 some of the harder or more challenging aspects these last few years? Well, let's start with the good side. The good side is that the anti-clinical work is doing really well. Yeah, meaning for Compass and Atai, so we're moving forward yeah, with our drugs, um, the, the results are great. Like uh, the Compass Phase 2B study, Compass moved now into Phase 3, but the same for MAP. So I think sort of throughout the, the, the psychedelic universe, which is, I would say, largely MAPs with MDMA, if you want to call it a psychedelic, and then Compass and Atai, because as you know, which I'm very proud of, yeah, we can come to that, like that we have the patterns uh, and all of that. Um, so that isn't reflected in the share prices at all. Yeah, so what is my explanation? Two things. The one is biotech as a whole is, 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 I don't think it's in trouble because the companies are doing fine, but like the whole sort of, um, the whole, um, I don't know how, uh, how much we should go into economics, but the whole interest rate spiral or the whole inflation uh, spiraling up and interest rates uh, being risen, whatever. Yeah, it obviously influences the most companies whose cash flows are further out than tomorrow. Yeah, because most models in finance are built on a DCF model, discounted cash flow. So practically, the longer you sort of have to discount, the more the discount factor matters. And the discount factor is related to the interest rates. Yeah, so it was a natural thing that in a rising interest rate environment, biotech stocks would go down or sh should go or have to go down. But then what has happened, because biotech is 
is a more closed industry than people think. Yeah, it's a kind of a I mean, yes, retail was in it, but like it's it's at the end, it's kind of a small industry compared to broader tech or whatever. Yeah, sort of while maybe in average, and then come to uh, psychedelics uh, in particular, but in average, maybe the biotech industry should have gone down thirty percent. Yeah, yeah, and that's it. That would be sort of the mathematical, as long as you can say that that way, like right way. Yeah always with an industry and then we also have to admit that biotech started very from a very high point because like after covid yeah it was sort of the the, the biotech stocks in generally again it's not an industry observation were very high so so practically once they started to go down actually that became extreme like it is always on the stock market you have hypes and you have depressions yeah and sort of the 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 normal correction which was sort of warranted because of rising interest rates became way amplified yeah uh, by liquidity issues in stocks that are which created sort of really like actually the longest and darkest winter biotech has gone through at least since 20 years yeah so uh but let's turn it around i'm an eternal optimist yeah um this is maybe one in generally not talking about the tire specifically but in generally i think yeah you get really amazing biotech companies for uh how is it a dime on the penny or whatever yeah or penny on the dime or you know what i want to say like a very cheap yeah dime on the dollar dime on the dollar yeah um so it's i think it's 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 a it's a real one of maybe the best times ever to invest newly uh into biotech so having said that i think there is a special burden on psychedelic stocks especially on compass and atai because at the moment while i think nobody really disagrees that the probability that these substances will be approved soon is very high. I think even like if you would talk to a farmer CEO, to a scientist, they all like, look, your data, and by the way, the same is true for maps, yeah, is really very, very solid. Yeah. I mean, to say the least, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, yes, this, this should be approved, will be approved, whatever. But it can't come to be bad. Pharma companies and actually most investors, especially obviously in downturns, people become very like, oh my God, I don't want to do any novel stuff. Like, are like, the approval is just one thing. You have to then commercialize it. You have to bring it to the patients. Yeah. And there is a lot of skepticism of some big investors and especially of the pharma side, how easy that rollout and commercialization will go. Uh, meaning, it's just different. It's not the typical, oh, pop a pill by day, like go to your pharmacy. As you said, you have to go to a therapist, you have to do work before, whatever. It's just novel. By the way, it's not negative at all. Even they don't say it's negative. It's just like it's an, different. It's a new paradigm. It's a new paradigm. And in times like these, people don't like new paradigms. Yeah. And are overly negative. I actually have an extremely optimistic view, meaning I think both MAPS and COMPASS with their respective substances, they will positively surprise for one very simple reason, which I think most people who haven't done it or haven't seen loved ones doing it and being helped then, um, uh, can see it. Like, I have never met a person who was touched by psychedelics who didn't become an advocate. Mm -hmm. That mustn't mean they go on TV, but an advocate, I mean, who you tell your parents, you tell your partner, you tell your best friends because you see how good it is and you want them to be helped as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So literally from all the people touched by side, every single person became an advocate. One in their small circles, others who go on TV and talk about publicly, but you talk about it. Have you ever seen that with Prozac or any SSRI or whatever? No. Yeah. People don't talk about it because it's shit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think pharma companies at the moment and big investors who are skeptical underestimate that bottom-up power mm -hmm. and demand. Once these drugs will be approved, people will go to their therapist mm -hmm. and say, look, I don't want to try literally bad stuff before. Uh, why don't we real start medicine. with Give it? Me real yeah, medicine. Give me yeah. that what my yeah. cousin was helped. Yeah. Right. So the viral effect of that therapy is completely underestimated. Yes, we need to create infrastructure. Yes, we need to create, uh, sorry, we need to train uh, therapists, but also therapists want to be trained because mm -hmm. like, I have spoken to so many therapists who are like, I can't even, I can't even imagine the frustration they have because like, it's a little bit like you're an oncologist and you're not allowed to use chemotherapy, although right. you know it works. Yeah, so that's the fact. Like most therapists are, I, 
If they're old enough, they maybe used it in the past when it was still available. They know it helped their patients yeah, and they can't at the moment. So I don't see at all why this would take overly long. Yeah, I'm actually optimistic that the rollout success and the rollout speed will surprise everybody positively. Because there's so much of a groundswell Already, so much therapists education. Are so open for it. Yeah. Therapists are open yeah. for it. People are talking. I mean, it's all over the place, and people know that this old stuff doesn't work. They want, they want yeah. the the new medicine that's here. But that's, that's to come back to your question. That's the reason, though, that pharma and investors alike, sort of, let's call it traditional, whatever. They don't like, or don't want to embrace. Like is the wrong word. They don't want to embrace that new paradigm, especially in a downturn. That's what it is. Like in downturns, become so, and that's the reason why psychedelic stocks are actually more hurt than normal biotech stocks. But this will change. Okay, we have like seven minutes left. So a few few final questions to touch on. One, um, we talked about longevity a little bit already. Physiologically, is there any relationship between the impact that psychedelics have on the body and certain key hallmarks of, of longevity? Well, is there any relationship between BDNF for example, in longevity or anti-inflammatory well, yeah, I mean, in longevity. So, um, yeah, I mean, we assume, again, it's the same a little bit with microdosing. We have, this is a, a world where research is at the very beginning, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, but it seems fairly logical. Like, if you, better not, let's not talk about our body first, like, let's talk about your brain. Like, even if we are successful, not if, when we're successful with Rejuveron Cameron and others in the field and make our bodies live longer in a healthier state mm -hmm. we want the same for our mind yeah mm. so and my gut feeling that is not more than a gut feeling again mm. i want to always make sure like that people i really try to be in all worlds from the spiritual one but like when i talk about science yeah i actually appreciate the fda process in terms of let's do clinical studies i always come back to that and i want to do the same for the question can psychedelics prevent maybe neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson, uh, dementia. I personally think yes, but mm -hmm. there needs to be much work to be done. I can't say that with the same sort of conviction I have than with depression because in depression we've done the studies, but I think there is a huge potential uh, there. Yeah, but let's go even one step beyond. Like the one, I, one of my favorite topics, one of my big beliefs is that we have actually many, let's call it issues, which should be classified a treatable disease mm -hmm. because, but because every human being has suffered, we sort of kind of accepted it like a fate and not like a, like a thing we can change. Mm -hmm. the, one of the biggest ones is aging. We're really mm -hmm. lobbying at the moment, aging in itself and yeah. ultimately dying is not a disease. If you go to the FDA and say, hey, I found something for uh, for, for, for which, which counterfeits aging, they, it's really hard. Like you need to find much more concrete things. This is why what I said before, what Manuel did, Manuel Serrano, to really define, oh, these are these sub things. Yeah, He made them much more concrete. And by that we can sort of read run trials and say, look, we show that, I don't know, we can um, uh, reactivate stem cells and what's so on. So, but like, so, but the same problem we have on a, on a conceptual basis with, with aging, where aging in itself is not, I think we're going to change that soon with, uh, with a lot of lobby and bipartisan support, but aging at, at the moment is not a disease. So is, for example, take loneliness. Yeah, um, It's, mm. what is it? Characterizes like, uh, depression, yeah. oftentimes. Well, it's, but like, or... there's, like, some people like, are not depressive, maybe they get depressive. The question is, are you depressive and this is why we Chicken become or lonely, yeah. or are you lonely and you become different? So, yeah. But take Take, I said it just with Rick, like, I love my parents, everybody loves his parents, it's not something special to say, but I'm an only child, so I really want them to do well as long as they can. In a so, so then I look at some of their friends, whatever, and they, 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 they sit at home, although they physically fit, but like mm -hmm. something changes in older age, and although they have all the time in the world... Yeah, meaning it's always say like being old should be like being in high school. You hang out with your friends, you go on trips, like yeah. Mm -hmm. But instead they sit at home. So mm -hmm. is it now society who sends people to old people's home? Partly yes. So I think we make mistakes in how we treat old people and we should be much more integrating them. But there is also a point that like I think even 
if they have the time and even if they have the opportunity, it's just way harder for older people to make new friends. Mm -hmm. So we accept that like a fact. If I tell you that, like I was like, yeah, that's the case. Like, and, uh, and if I already it's usually just at church or, yeah. you know, a social club. Or, but even but there, even like then, people it's... say, so, and, or the other way around, if I ask you, when did you make your, I mean, you're young anyway, but if you ask a 50 year old, when did you make your best friend? Most college. people say in college. Yeah. So why is that? Like, why can't a 60 year old, a 70, an 80 year old not make a truly deep friendship which would mm -hmm. make the last years much more magical. I do think that is a brain problem. I think this is a, let's, DC sounds so negative. I think this is an issue mm -hmm. we can cure, maybe with psychedelics. Yeah, maybe we can give people back the openness and also the awe for the world, like, and for other people we had when we were 20, when we were like at college and we were like, the world is our oyster. And we were sitting like till 7 a.m. in the morning around the campfire and we're talking about life and God. Like, I still do that, by the way, because I think this is like yeah, all what life is about. But like people lose that. And I can't give you a definitive answer why we lose that. Yeah, is it society who makes us lose that? Yeah, is it something happening in our brain which makes us lose that? Is it a combination? We But both. I think there is, I want to do, yeah, this is at the beginning, this won't be a company because like, again, you need to almost lobby like and, and sort of do ground research. But I think there is much more to learn about why we, in our brain, not just in our body, are what we are. And then I think my hunch is, though, that then for many issues like loneliness, psychedelics could be an answer. One, well, and also this, kind of what you're speaking to is what I would call a re-indigenizing. So there are these indigenous traditions, the ways that we live for a long time, as we've already talked about, in community, around the fire, in groups of 25 to 50 to 100 with elders and chieftains, right? So there's almost like a push of, with industrialism, wiping out a lot of that knowledge and wisdom. How do we start to, how do we start to bring that back? And I think with you, what I love about your approach is you're very te technology driven, right? You've talked about this next human agenda uh, that's coming out. But what I'm also hearing in, in this is like, you, you understand that plants and the intelligence in plants, intelligence of psychedelics, it's a symbiosis, between the two. And I'd love for you to just speak about that, right? When we think about the human agenda, we think about human intelligence, but ayahuasca, psilocybin, wachuma, you know, even we would, you know, 5-MeO, Bufo, it has an intelligence in its own. How can that plant intelligence support our next human agenda, you know, and where we're going with technology? Very good, very deep questions. Let me think like, it's, like, like, it's not like, how do I... First of all, I think the, in a very broad concept, I think one of the biggest problems of our time, but in generally of humans, is our ego in terms of these feelings separated from other human beings, from nature, but equally from technology. We see all of it like bits and pieces and like we are not part of it or that is not part of us, yeah? And I think that is kind of wrong. I think that all is way, it's, I don't know how I, I describe it uh, in English, but like, but like, I think this is, it's all much more closer and more integrated. Maybe like you said, uh, en passant, like, like a mycelium network, yeah? So, 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 and, and I think it's all influencing in a positive way each other. We need to just look through it. I, I know a lot of people have, fear of technology because it's like changing so much but it's almost like i think it's almost like these creative process we're giving now birth to new things maybe we're giving as a species birth to ai maybe we coexist with it yeah i think there are, yeah there are many things which sort of are again problematic because of that divisiveness we feeling and which i unfortunately think that's sort of the biggest worry i have is like this divisiveness which is drastically increasing, meaning the whole problem of American politics is this divisiveness that people can't find a common ground anymore, can't, and you don't even need to always find a common ground, you, you just need to respect that there are other people and they are maybe much closer to you on the one side, but you also have to give them sort of like, let them be and let them have their own views and everybody's like so hostile. Yeah, Sorry, I'm a little bit drifting off, but I think that's all related. And here, I think, for example, psychedelics can also have a huge impact on easing people a, into a new age of technology, which a lot of people are afraid, Yeah, but also easing people into a new or maybe new, like it's not new, like maybe 
bringing people again closer together, which doesn't, by the way, always mean yeah, um, that we believe the same. Like people sometimes, I have had this one question in a podcast which really stuck with me because it was kind of like, or it was no, sorry, it wasn't a point, it was an audience where somebody said, oh, you have taken psychedelics, that uh, you are spiritual, and yet you are a capitalist. Yeah, as if they, no, it's important because like it shows something. It shows that people think we are uniform, and that this person who asked the question believes that psychedelic psychedelics would make you a certain way or would form a communist, you. Pardon? A communist, or yeah, a socialist, or whatever, exactly, or whatever, whatever that person. But by the way, I think it couldn't be further away from the truth. I think we are. In many ways, we're the same, but in other things, we're different. And I think that difference is the beauty of life. Like, I want people to have other views, and I want to debate it. And I might even say I don't agree with you, but I need to accept that there is a human being who has a certain way of looking at things. And I accept it because it's good, and I have a different one, maybe. So, and I think psychedelics, what they really do, they make you aware and learn about yourself and embrace yourself, whatever that is. And in my case, psychedelics really showed me that in this, at least life, yeah, it's my passion and sort of duty almost like to be an entrepreneur, to create companies who hopefully contribute a little bit to global happiness and well-being. Yeah? So that's sort of my, if I say my destiny, that sounds so grandiose, but like that's what I feel this is the right thing for me. And there might like be... Like your dharma is yeah, what the, the Buddhist exactly. would say, right? That's yeah. the perfect word for it. Yeah, and there might other people be who say, oh, my dharma is to be uh, a teacher for children in uh, Somalia. And there is not, there is no, it's not a competition whose dharma is more valuable. It's just, it is. Like that's, and we should accept that and celebrate that diversity. Yeah, uh, instead of trying to force people into that uh, uniform mass. We each have a way, the way, right? as the Taoists would say, the middle way, right? We have a path, and where those paths converge is where reality is, is created. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll end with a quote, which I think is relevant to this. It's from Edmund O. Wilson. He says, we have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology, and I think one of the beautiful parts about psychedelics and plant medicines is they help us to evolve in such a way to hold the complexity of that godlike technology. That is perfect. I will use that. That yeah. is like, it's, I know in you the, the quote, but it is actually the perfect way to put it. Love it. Thank you for joining us for the podcast, Thank you. Christian. This was a pleasure. Cool. Yeah. Hey folks, this conversation is bigger than just you or me, so please leave a review or comment so others can find the podcast. This small action matters way more than you can even imagine. You can also go deeper into this episode at thethirdwave.co forward slash podcast, where you'll find full show notes, transcripts, and all the links that were mentioned in this conversation. To get weekly updates from the leading edge of this third wave of psychedelics, sign up for our newsletter at thethirdwave.co forward slash newsletter. You can also find us on Instagram at third wave is here or subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash the third wave. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to stay up to date on the third wave of psychedelics, subscribe to this channel and visit thethirdwave.co, where you'll find plenty of free resources on the intentional and responsible use of psychedelic medicine.